I said, what's like the, <clears throat> what's the most expensive piece of like clothing you own? Anybody? Got something? Yeah, I didn't have any people that wanted to play the first game either, or the first service either. So uh, I have a Green Bay Packers jersey. It's like got number 12 on there for Aaron Rodgers. And um, I never pay like full price for anything, including clothes. But um, I think I found it on sale for like $65. I'm going to be wearing it today when I get home um, until after the game. It depends on the outcome of the game. If they win, I'll keep wearing it. Um, but it, that's not my most expensive. I have a suit that I wear like... Um, Every once in a while, I have to wear a suit, and I went to like Brooks Brothers, and you know, you get like a suit, and you get like another suit half price, and I probably have two suits that cost like 400 bucks or something like that total. Um, yeah, I, I just wear them, you know, once in a while, but that's not my most expensive article of clothing. Um, my most expensive article of clothing I bought almost 15 years ago, and it cost uh, $700. So does anyone want to guess what that was? Yeah, it was a robe, so like a clergy robe, and you know, it's 100% wool. Um, now, there's only like two professions where it's socially acceptable to wear a robe, like a, a clergy and a, a judge. Um, I didn't say that, I forgot about the story. That one time I was going to a, a friend of mine, like I was actually doing his funeral. Um, he died uh, prematurely when he was like 35 or 36, and I was driving up to Northwest Iowa, um, and I was like, the speed limit's like 55 miles an hour, and I was doing like 65 or something. I mean, it's just like tractors and corn, and that's all that's up there, except this one police officer who uh, got me. So, uh, like, you know, the police officer said, oh, how fast are you going? It's like, you know how fast. Don't ask me that question. You got the little radar. I'm going 65. It was technically a 67. So then he goes back, and, you know, he comes back up, and he just gives me a warning. And so, well, just be aware, uh, the uh, speed limit's 55 uh, miles an hour. And I had my robe hanging up in the back seat because I was going to the funeral. And uh, he says, uh, be careful, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just carry the whole thing around all the time. And like, uh, they all think I'm a judge. <laughs> so this was about four years ago. Uh, I did a wedding like right before school started. So it would have been like the Saturday before Millard you know, starts school. Um, so then the next day would have been the We Serve Day. You know, so I just put the robe in the trunk of my car, and you know, we went out. I think our, our We Serve project was uh, doing communion and a worship service at one of our nursing homes. So we did that. And like, we drive around to the schools and make sure like, there's enough paint and you know, take pictures. And we had to like, take paint from one place to the other. So they have all the bright paint. Have you ever seen those maps before like, on the schools that we paint, like red and yellow and blue and green, like all these bright, fun colors? And I put the paint in the trunk. And getting ready the, for the kids uh, for school the next day, and I was cleaning out the car, cleaning out the trunk. I opened up the trunk, and like, the paint had spilled all over the robe. So like, you know, all of a sudden I was gonna, I'm going to be like Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat. Like, I had this robe that's like all these colors. So I went and sprayed it off. Like, it was starting to come out, but like, it wasn't coming out. And so I got the kids to school. I, you know, took the robe to the dry cleaner. And like, I, she said, well, what do you got for me? I said, something you've never seen before. I got this robe that has all this paint on it. Um, so I got it back about a week later. Um, and they just did like this remarkable job. Um, yeah, you can still, if you look really closely, you can still see a little bit of yellow by, you know, some of the stitching, and you can see a little bit of blue here, but, you know, if I was, if, you know, if I was wearing it now, like, unless you were really looking, you probably couldn't see it. Um, now, um, I'm going to come back to this uh, uh, in just a second, but I want to go um, and read what, uh, we're going to continue the Sermon on the Mount. So last week, we started with uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and here, um, what we did is what it means to really live like the blessed life. Now, when we say blessings, a lot of times what we're going to mean is like financial blessings, like I'm, I'm blessed, like God has provided for me, or I'm blessed with uh, this relationship, or I'm blessed with good health. Now, the problem with all those things, I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of them. I mean, you know, money is good, health is good, friendships are good. But the issue becomes, what about when they're not like healthy? What if they disappear? Um, and, and they can and they will. Um, so when Jesus says that we're blessed, his word blessing means a little bit different than what we would say for the word blessing. You know, and like what I said last week is like, I am blessed. You are blessed because, uh, because we know a God who offers hope to the hopeless. 
We are blessed because we know a God. We can experience the forgiveness that he gives to us who are sinners. Yeah, we are, we are, uh, we are blessed because uh, God can give strength to the weak and to the powerless. You know, that's why we're blessed. So when Jesus says, blessed are, or you are blessed when, um, this is the type of blessing that he's talking about. We looked at John uh, chapter 16, verse 22, when, when Jesus says, this joy that I give to you is a joy that the world cannot take. You know, so the joy that we talk about in these blessings from Christ himself are something that the world cannot take away from us. There's God, they're God's gift to us. So in verse 6, he continues these beatitudes. Um, we looked at the first three last week. Uh, here's three more this week. God blesses those who hunger for thirst and justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Now we're going to look mostly at verse 8 today. Um, God blesses those uh, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. So the Greek word, uh, the Greek word for pure is katharos. Now, uh, really like when the Greeks would use this word, um, what they were describing is laundry that's usable. Yes, they're talking about a robe without paint on it. You know, like a robe that you can wear in front of people and not look like a complete fool. Um, they would have been talking about, like, uh, and this would have meant something to them, because, like, when we have dirty clothes, what we do is we, like, throw it in the washer and then the dryer, and then all of a sudden it's clean. Yeah, but to have clean clothes to them, it meant something, right? Because they didn't have a washer and a dryer. They did all the stuff by hand. Um, you know, so katharos would be, like, at the end of a long, hot day in the fields. You get to come home, and you get to change it into something that's clean, and it feels really good. Now, another way that they would use this word katharos uh, is to describe wine. It's like they didn't have the fermentation and winemaking abilities that we have today. So oftentimes, like wine that was um, you know, produced in this era, it would have had like a little bit of a, mental, uh, a metal uh, taste to it, you know, if it would get corrupted that way, because they would like, you know, run it through some metal to like, you know, distill out some of the bad stuff in there. And um, wine that was katharos had no taste of metal. So that meant it was pure wine, it was good. You know, this is the stuff you paid for, this is the stuff you wanted to drink. Now, this beatitude right here, uh, verses 6 through 8, especially verse 8, um, what I do is I, I think this causes us self-reflection. Now, many of us don't like self-reflection because we have to look at parts of ourselves that, uh, you know, we don't like. I think most of us have those parts, like we look at ourselves, and yes, there are things about us uh, that we would like to change. So let's just look at self-reflection in the case of our, our spiritual life. Um, I won't talk about finances. I won't talk about really. I'll just talk about like spiritual life. So when you serve, um, do we serve out of selflessness or are we serving out of uh, self-display? So Jesus says, uh, blessed are the, the pure at heart for they will see God. Like in our service, when we can serve from selflessness and not self-display, then we will experience God. Um, is our church going an attempt to meet God and experience Him? Or are we here because we're fulfilling a responsibility? So if you're here because you're fulfilling a responsibility, um, there's a chance that number eight is not going to apply to you. If you're here because you've woke up this morning and you came and you're expecting to meet God, you know, Jesus says, blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see God. Is our prayer and Bible reading engaged upon um, a sincere desire to be in company with God? Or uh, does it give us like feelings of uh, superiority because you know, we're doing this spiritual thing? You know, for us to experience God and see God fully, Jesus says, um, let's go into this time with this uh, desire, this longing, this passion to experience God and his grace. And the last one is our religion, a thing in which we are conscious of, of nothing else than our utter and absolute need for God, or is it something that we're doing for our own comfort and our own security? So to examine like our motives and things like this isn't always easy to do because it causes us to look at parts of us that we may not like. Um, so Jesus goes on to say, that it's only the pure at heart. It's only the selfless. It's only 
those who are wanting to meet God. It's only those who desire the company of God. It's only those who are utterly aware of our desperate need for God. Jesus says it is the pure at heart um, who will see God. It's one of the simple facts of life, and the simple fact of life will only be experienced when we do it. You cannot experience it on the other side. So let me give you some examples. So let's just say it's nighttime, and you go out and you look at the stars, or you look at the nighttime sky. Where are you going to see? Well, you're going to see a bunch of stars and probably the moon, depending upon like, how much light pollution and how many clouds there are. That's what I will see. That's probably what most of you will see as well. Now, um, what's the astronomer going to see when she goes out and looks at the nighttime sky? She is going to see things that the rest of us can't see. She's going to say, okay, well, there's uh, that constellation. Um, you know, there's the Little Dipper, and there's uh, uh, Gemini. And there's that star over there, and that star um, that used to guide people uh, to Israel. And that star's name is uh, Zeus, and Zeus was the, uh, the Greek god, and here's the meaning behind the name of that star. You know, she might be able to like, see planets like Venus or Mars or Jupiter and say, yeah, you can only see this planet during certain times because it needs the sun's light for us to actually see it. You know, she can look at the moon and tell you whether it's waxing or waning or full or new or whatever. So she can see it one way. Then like, what, how would a navigator... Um, you think back before, like we had GPS, like how did the ships uh, get around? Well, they used the stars. Yeah, you know, the ship could get lost during the day, but at nighttime, the ship would find its way because the map is the sky. Yeah, you know, so the navigator can say, okay, we need to follow those two stars to get us to London or to New York City or to wherever you're going. So the person, the average person, the, the navigator and the astronomer are going to see things totally differently. All right, what about this one? Did you hear about like the painting um, that was discovered in April in Scotland? Like it was at this estate and they had invited uh, an art historian to come and look at another piece of uh, art. So the art historian was coming in and like he was going, uh, you know, he's being, you know, taken to see this piece of art and, and he saw something. I mean, this painting had been in this family for, uh, it says 1899, so it would have been um, 116 years at this point. He saw something that no one else saw. There's a painting on the wall that was a picture of uh, the Virgin Mary. Now, this art historian knew that this uh, painting had been missing. Um, and he looked on the wall, and, and he saw that that was the original Raphael. He went and looked, and he says, where did you get this? And they looked it up, and in 1899, the family paid $25, which today is like $2,562 or something, um, for that painting. Now, this painting is in the process of uh, restoration. They verified it was the original. Today, it's worth over $25 million. Now, just think of all the thousands of people that have been at parties at this estate that have seen that painting. And the art historian comes in, and he can see what nobody else sees. So let's go back to verse 8. Here, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. So for those of you who can pull off a pure heart, you will see things that the rest of us can't. You will see God himself. You will see things that, that, that nobody else can see. Now, um, life happens uh, best um, when we stop faking it and we no longer uh, perform for others because we understand that God is only looking for our authentic selves. Now, pure at heart, what it means, it means that we're not worried about what other people think of us. We're not putting time and energy into impressing other people. What we are doing um, is we are basically the same person that other people see us as you know, who we are when we look in the mirror. The people that Jesus uh, is are speaking to, like they would have understood the word purity. There is no paint on the robe. There is no metal in the wine. Our heart is not infected with any of the wrong things. Now the Pharisees are the example that Jesus often gave of, uh, of people whose hearts were not pure. Now I'm going to make a case for the Pharisees. Like these were the leaders of the church. You know, these were, these were good men. 
you know, if you're a Pharisee, you would have, uh, you know, gone to the Christian school. Um, you would have gone to the Christian university and majored in, like, philosophy and religion. You would have gone to the seminary and finalized your education. Um, you know, you would have been the brightest of the brightest. Not everyone makes it to this point, even if you wanted to. Um, they were not only leaders in the church, they were leaders in the community. Um, oftentimes they were lawyers and, and, and teachers as well. Now what they did is they kept the rules. Um, and the rules they kept were very stringent. They handled money in a certain way. Uh, the Pharisees, they fasted. They, they only ate certain foods. And they did not eat with unclean people. Now Jesus, uh, he was not very impressed with the Pharisees. He loved them. But he was not impressed with... Uh, their behavior because Jesus knew that purity of the heart was what God is looking for, not perceived purity on external actions. So let's go to Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to read about one of Jesus' actions uh, with the Pharisee. We'll start in verse 1 at Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with their unbearable religious demands, and they never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do, they do for show. Okay, so I'm going to look at two verses here. We're going to look at verse 4 first, that they crush people with these, uh, these religious demands. Okay, so if you're new to church, if uh, you're new to the water's edge, um, if you're a middle school student, if you're a high school student, if you're like a really young adult, one of the things that I want you to hear this morning is that uh, the Christian faith is not about strict adherence uh, to a set of regulations. That's just simply not what it is. I'm going to tell you that I have two sons, a 15-year-old and a 10-year-old. Now, I have expectations of them. You know, there's certain things that they're supposed to do. There are certain things that they're not supposed to do. Now, we have this expectation of them in place because we love them. Um, now, they're kids. They're human beings. They don't live up to these expectations all the time. Do you think because they don't live up to these expectations all the time that I don't love them? No, they already have my love. These expectations are to help them. So what we do is we practice forgiveness. You know, we talk about what it means to grow. We talk about how we can learn from our failure. Like I was like vacuuming my uh, living room like last week and I lifted up one of the ottomans and like, you know those little like kind of like metallic Capri Sun things that you like suck and then they become flat? There's like 15 of these things under my ottoman. It's like, you know, I go and talk to the offender, it's the young guy, um, the 10 year old, and I said, the, the trash can, it's like 18 feet that way. You can like take it and open it up and put it in and go back to what you were doing. You know, but like, <laughs> We practice forgiveness. We grew. Um, David doesn't have to do that stuff to earn my approval. I already approve of him. I love him. There's nothing he can do to change that. You know, the law is here in place because one day he's going to be married, and his wife probably isn't going to be as nice as me. <laughs> She's going to say, David, what is all this? This is gross. You're sleeping on the couch. So I'm trying to prepare him for life just because there's, like, law. I mean, that's the strict adherence stuff. Um, Now, number five, uh, verse five here, everything they do is for show. Now, here I'm going to ask you and invite you to a moment of self-reflection. Is what you do for show? Spiritually, uh, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your work, the way you present yourself to other people, your friends. Um, You know, and here, like, um, you know, they're trying to look good for others, the Pharisees are. Have you, all, have you done that before? You try to look good for other people? Like in real life or social media or something? Like we don't want people to know that we're not perfect. So we try to look better. And then, you know, the second thing they're trying to do is earn God's approval. Like if I tithe, if I don't eat pork, um, you know, because I serve, God is going to love me. Um, 
I'll tell you what, like, if you're doing either of those or both of those, there's some things that I know about you. I know that you're tired. Because I've tried to do these things before and it, it wears you out. Trying to be somebody that you're not. Um, that's crazy stuff. Why would you mess up something that's perfect and beautiful and work so hard to replace it with something that's fake? You know, if that's what you'd stop, like, that's, like you're not blessed. Like, blessed are those who are pure at heart, for they will see God. Now, we're going to look at a, a recovering Pharisee. His name is Paul. So Paul was the one that wrote much of the New Testament. He was the one that planted uh, many of the early churches. But Paul had a past, just like a lot of other people that I know. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee, and he was darn proud of it. Um, we find this in Philippians chapter 3. I think I'm going to start in verse 5. Yeah, verse 5. Um, so Paul here, he's post-conversion, and Paul says, I was circumcised uh, when I was eight days old. I said eight years old at the first service. That would be kind of awkward and painful. But uh, <laughs> I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a, a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. So Paul right up front, he's trying to impress people. Um, like, hey, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. Like, this right there means that I'm a somebody. Um, you're not from the tribe of Benjamin. I am, and um, just wanted to let you all know that. Uh, I was uh, a member of the Pharisees. So basically he's saying, okay, I went to uh, uh, you know, the prep school, I went to Yale, and I did my um, theological training at the University of Chicago. Like he's dropping all these, uh, dropping all these names. Um, I, I, they demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. Um, I was so zealous. I was so zealous as a Pharisee that I harshly persecuted the church. So here, if we get a glimpse into Paul's past, he's trying to earn God's love by persecuting what he thought was a threat to God. And then he concludes in verse uh, 6 there, uh, and as far as righteousness, I obeyed the law without a fault. Gosh, that had to wear him out, and it did. Because when Paul was on the road to Damascus um, on one of his journeys, he just collapsed. He found himself uh, face down in the sand. And it was there on that road to Damascus that he had this encounter with God that changed his life forever. Um, laying face first in the sand, he traded external approval for an internal pursuit of passionately chasing and knowing and experiencing God. So verse 7, Paul starts talking about this transformation that he experienced earlier. This is Paul's testimony. So in verse 7, uh, he says, I once uh, thought of these things were, as valuable, but now consider them all worthless. His education, his upbringing, his place in the church, they're all worthless um, because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have disregarded, uh, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer uh, count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. So like, listen to this. If you're trying to earn God's approval, um, listen to Paul. You don't count on your own righteousness through obeying Christ. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And here's how he concludes this. Um, this is... A biblical picture of purity of the heart when he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Okay, so uh, Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, he wrote a book um, in the 1840s. It's called uh, Purity of the Heart is to Will One Thing. Now he gives the best description of what it means to have purity of the heart that I've ever come across. Now, the premise of this book is that the Christian faith is not a matter of dogmatic adherence uh, to rules and behaviors, but rather it is this relentless and dynamic and passionate pursuit of a living God. Now, uh, Kierkegaard was writing this book in what he called the age of distraction. Now, do you know what distracted people in Copenhagen back in the 1840s? Um, it was newspapers and magazines. 
like these new things were out and like all of a sudden um, instead of like sitting on the canal like talking to each other um, having a meal together they're like reading these newspapers and magazines now if Kierkegaard were alive today in the United States he would go nuts because it's not newspapers and magazines like we all have our phones and our computers um, we have the USA Today and CNN and ESPN and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. I mean, if Denmark was like beginning the age of distraction in the 1840s, the United States in 2017 exemplifies the age of distraction. Now, uh, what Kierkegaard saw as well is the country was uh, thriving economically. Like people all of a sudden like were able to take trips on the weekends and, and not work so hard because inventions were coming out and life was becoming easier. And he saw this as the biggest threat to the church. You know, so I was in Denmark this summer, and um, Denmark, uh, you, you know what percent of the people in Denmark go to church on a weekly basis today? It's 2%. That's two out of every 100 people. We could hardly find a church to go to that Sunday. And when we went, it was mostly international people. Like, you know, he predicted what was going to happen, and like, we today in the United States live in the age of distraction. You know, the things that Kierkegaard saw happening in Denmark are happening today. We deal with things like comparison and envy because we live in the age of distraction. Our hearts are no longer pure. Um, you know, uh, like, uh, let me give you an example. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'll just, Kierkegaard wrote this book because he was calling the church to uh, repentance and confession. I'll give you mine, like, this morning. Um, so, uh, you guys know me. I'm a Green Bay Packer football fan. Um, Loved them since I was a kid. Now, do you know what happens at uh, 3.40 this afternoon? Yeah, there's a Packers game. That's a good, good, good guess, Bob. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're playing the Cowboys, right? Now, um, ever since we won last week and they announced the game, I have been looking forward to this game. Like on Monday, I was thinking, gosh, I cannot wait until Sunday afternoon when the Packers get to play the Cowboys. Like, I'm so excited about this. And David and I, he's got his Packers jersey on. I'm going to change into mine. We're going to be in front of our TV, and we're going to watch the game. Like, I'm so excited about this. Now, um, this is the confession part. I was thinking as I was doing the sermon, like, like Craig, you are ridiculous. Um, are you excited, like, tomorrow morning to wake up and, and pray? Are you that excited? Are you that excited to come to church at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning and see all your friends and encounter God and Christ and the Holy Spirit together? You know, we live in the age of distraction. Christ is calling us to live in the age of passion. You know, and, and here's what happens here. Um, to recover um, our authentic heart, what we do is we passionately pursue the holy you know, we put away the distractions, whatever. I mean, you can still watch the game this afternoon. I mean, Jesus, if he was alive today, he would have been a Green Bay Packers fan. Um, you know, you can still watch the game, but the point is, is that we pursue the holy before everybody else. Now, if you trade in your authenticity as a child of God for safety, you may be experiencing the following. Anger, depression, addiction, rage, blame, resentment, grief, um, the authentic self, the pure heart, is really the soul that is made visible. Um, if, you, if you have this authentic self and you see yourself first and foremost the child of God and the primary purpose of your life is to live in community with God, then you'll have no competition in your life because you already have everything that you need. Um, life happens best when we stop faking it and we no longer perform for others because we understand that God is only looking to be in a relationship with our authentic self. So um, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. You know, I'd do this, I think you'd do this, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way you see them. People judge uh, by outward appearances. But listen to this, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now I believe in life that there is nothing that is as beautiful as seeing a person who is fully themselves. Now imagine if you could do that, if you could go through today, just being fully yourself and nobody else. 
If you're a little sad, it's all right to be sad. If you're a little anxious, it's all right to be anxious. Um, you know, what if we could live without perfection but live authentically? Um, now, uh, I don't want any of us to trade in like this authenticity for approval. Um, as your heart, as our hearts become more pure, what is going to happen is that we are going to experience this amazing blessing that we will see, know, and experience Him. And this is like the loveliest thing, that like the real you, the real, authentic, pure you, getting to know the real and authentic and pure God. And when that happens, Jesus says that we're blessed. So let us pray.